We've reached module 12. Module 12 is about chemical equilibrium. Let's start with free energies of reaction. So here is Jacobus Henricus van Toff. And van Toff used the ideas of reaction rates in order to describe the dynamics of chemical equilibrium. And this is a tremendously important topic in chemistry. Uh, most of you actually probably know van Toff's name for a different reason. He also published a paper early in his career that proposed that the bonding about a carbon atom could be tetrahedral. So it turns out that he didn't put that work into his uh, doctoral thesis because it was considered much too controversial to be accepted. And I think in the uh, last module I had a good example of uh, the battles that can occur between scientists over controversial ideas. So it turns out at the time Van Hoff was working in a, a veterinary college and so scorn was heaped on him when he proposed tetrahedral carbon, in part because, of course, what, you could, what could you expect from somebody who was working with cows, for example? Of course, it turned out to be exactly right and now forms the basis for our understanding of structural organic chemistry. Uh, but that was not, in fact, what he was awarded the first Nobel Prize in chemistry for. Instead, it was for his work in uh, chemical equilibrium and dynamics. So, Many of the most important applications of thermodynamics are to systems at chemical equilibrium. And usually, if it's benchtop chemistry, what we're working with is constant temperature and pressure, an open flask in a room that is hopefully holding its temperature. And we know that the condition for equilibrium under those circumstances is that delta G equals zero for some potential process. If you're not at equilibrium, then we can take a process that wants to occur and decide what direction it goes based on looking at the sign of delta G. So there will be a spontaneous move in some direction where technically we would want to know about the infinitesimal change. Is it positive? Is it negative? That will tell us about the spontaneity of a process. Delta implies a, a long path potentially. And with what we have so far uh, from all of our armament that we've built up, we should be able to compute and make predictions about the free energy, and we know something about the temperature dependence of the free energy, in order to derive relationships between the free energy and the equilibrium constant for a chemical reaction. <clears throat> and so I want to start by defining a concept, uh, the extent of reaction. And so let me start with some generic gas phase reaction that's balanced. So here's my balanced chemical equation, nu sub A times something A plus nu sub B times some sub compound B in equilibrium with nu sub Y. So these are stoichiometric coefficients, nu sub A, B, Y, Z. And these are molecules. And this appears to be in the gas phase. So the extent of reaction, Xi, which I use just because I like to say Xi as many times as I can, um, is defined as how far have things gone? And so if you like, we know the number of moles of a reactant, in this case reactant A, will be equal to however many moles we started with minus the stoichiometric prefactor that appears in the balanced reaction times Xi. Right? And since this has units of moles and this has units of moles and this is unitless, Xi must also have units of moles. And for the products, however much product we have will be equal to however much we started with plus the stoichiometric coefficient times Xi. And so, so defined for all of these here. And so here's a little self-assessment, uh, you know, get comfortable with the use of Xi. So take a look at the specific example of a gas phase reaction involving ammonia, oxygen, nitrous oxide, and, uh, and water. And we'll come back after that nitric oxide, by the way. I think I, I may as well get the name right. Uh, nitric oxide, and I'll let you play with those. All right, here are the answers to the self-assessment. I think this probably was relatively simple, and it also helps to illustrate the concept of a, a limiting reagent and a, a maximum reaction extent. 
So I want to continue to look at this and uh, note, as, as I just mentioned, that xi can vary from zero, so that's where you just set up a system and let go, all the way to some maximum value that's dictated by stoichiometry. So you can't, for instance, lose more of whatever reagent you first run out of. That will dictate the maximum value of xi you can hit. And so this is just a particular example if your initial quantity of A and B, and so these zeros are meant to emphasize initial, are exactly equal to the stoichiometric coefficients here, then by definition of xi, the maximum xi is going to hit is one mole, all right? because then I'll have drained the entire stoichiometric amount. So now what I want to do is I want to take these definitions and I'll just differentiate. So this is pretty straightforward. So here's differential of the amounts of things. These are constants. They're just amounts that you started with. So when you differentiate them, they go to zero. And over here, you differentiate. And again, this is a constant. It's just a proportionality constant. So you get d c. And so one of the things you'll see is that, in essence, the number of reactants with a negative sign in front of it is going down as the reaction proceeds, as d c is positive, if it proceeds forward. And meanwhile, the products are going up. That, that should all be sort of obvious. Now, let's connect that to the Gibbs free energy. So let's think about free energy, which is a function of temperature, pressure. And for this balanced reaction, number of moles of A, number of moles of B, number of moles of Y, number of moles of Z. So when I do the total differential of the free energy, it's the partial derivative with respect to all those different variables with all the other variables held constant. And now I'll make my usual substitutions uh, for some of these differentials. So I can insert entropy for partial G, partial T. I can insert volume for partial G, partial P. I'll rewrite these in their usual compact form as chemical potentials. And if I'm at constant T and P, this first term is zero, the second term is zero. So DG is just going to be the sum over all the components, the chemical potential of the component times the variation in the number of moles of that component. Right? And I've just expanded it out again here. And the reason that that's useful is, rather than having to write this DG in terms of the differentials of every component, I can use the stoichiometry that came previously to relate all of these different component differentials to a single differential, dc. So dg becomes minus nu a mu a minus nu b mu b. It's kind of rhymes to say these various uh, Greek letters, I guess. I, I'll stop saying them now. dc. And finally, that lets me define something very useful. So I'm going to define the Gibbs free energy of reaction capital delta sub r of the Gibbs free energy. I'm going to now bring my dxc over. I'll have dg dxc, and it, it can depend, free energy can depend on temperature and pressure, so holding it constant, so I will write it as a partial derivative, is equal to this quantity. And if we think about the case of c varying from 0 to 1, remember it has units of moles, then we're talking about the molar free energy of reaction is defined by the stoichiometry coefficient times the chemical potential of this product plus the same thing for the second product minus that for the reactant, first reactant, minus that for the second reactant. So two points to make here. This number I'm going to define for an extent of reaction by a change of one mole. And also, it has no meaning whatsoever until you've specified a balanced chemical equation. I have to know what are these stoichiometry coefficients. Right? But with those in hand, I can have this definition, which is quite convenient. And we'll see how and why as we move forward in this module. So next, uh, we're going to look at the equilibrium constants, case of P, case of C, and case of A.